Hi, it's Dr. Ronald Lett from the Canadian Network for International Surgery. This lecture is from our trauma team training course, and it's about the initial assessment and triage of the trauma patient. The initial assessment involves four stages. Primary survey, resuscitation, secondary survey, and transfer for definitive care. The classic management of the trauma patient is A, B, C, D, E. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. That is still true, but we now talk about C, A, B, C, D, E, with C being for catastrophic hemorrhage. If there's catastrophic hemorrhage, that must be stopped before one goes on to A, B, C, D, E. So let's look at the primary survey. Airway with cervical spine control. Breathing, respiratory rate and effort. Circulation, blood pressure, pulse and hemorrhage control. Disability, neurological status. And exposure, looking at the entire patient. Simultaneously with primary survey is resuscitation. Following this is secondary survey, which is basically a complete physical examination. And your final step is transfer for definitive care. The primary survey is the first priority in the initial assessment. It involves airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. A key principle, when you find a problem during the primary survey, you fix it. So resuscitation really goes simultaneously with the primary survey. If the patient gets worse, we start from the beginning of the primary survey. Some critical patients in the emergency department may not progress beyond the primary survey. airway, the basic maneuvers, attain the airway, ventilate, oxygenate, maintain neck immobilization. Airway with C-spine protection. Why is it a priority? Loss of the airway can result in death in less than three minutes. Prolonged hypoxia inadequate perfusion results in end organ damage airway assessment the vital signs the respiratory rate the oxygen saturation are you using a pulse oximeter mental status a patient that's agitated or somnolent or in coma may just have an airway problem you must manage that immediately airway patency requires removal of secretions, signs are strider and obstruction. Any injury above the clavicle, above the collarbones could involve the airway. The ventilatory status, are accessory muscles being used? Is there retractions? Is there wheezing? Patients who are speaking normally generally do not have an immediate airway management problem. If they have a hoarse or weak voice, this may indicate subtle tracheal or laryngeal problems. Noisy respiration frequently indicates an obstructed respiratory tract. Intimately associated with airway is breathing. You must assess the full chest, expose it. You look at the respiratory rate. If it's less than 10, it's abnormal. If it's greater than 10, it's abnormal. Take immediate action if the rate is abnormal. Always oxygenate the trauma patient. 
use oxygen concentrators as an alternative to bottled or wall oxygen. Ventilate with a bag and a mask. A mechanical ventilator is not necessary. Assess for tension pneumothorax. Is there shifting of the trachea? Are there distended neck veins? Initial assessment. You've looked at airway, if you looked at breathing. Now let's look at circulation. You want to detect and treat shock. You need to have a good blood volume and cardiac output. Level of consciousness can go down due to low cardiac output. Look at the skin color. What's the pulse? If it's greater than 100, something is going on. If the systolic blood pressure is less than 100, be concerned. Capillary refill. If it's greater than two seconds, there could be a circulatory problem. There are some special situations in children and pregnant women. Both of them are vulnerable. We'll discuss them a little bit further later in this lecture. So, circulation, types of shock. In trauma, you must assume hemorrhagic shock until proven otherwise. It can result from internal or external bleeding. There can be obstructive causes of shock, cardiac tamponade or tension pneumothorax. Cardiac tamponade is treated with drainage of the pericardium, tension pneumothorax with placement of a chest tube. Neurogenic shock in spinal cord injury can be another cause. What are the sources of bleeding? The chest, the abdomen, the pelvis, and femur fractures, all are sources of large volume bleeding and can result in shock. What do you do? Two large IV lines. Monitor the heart. Monitor the blood pressure. Stop the bleeding. Apply direct pressure to whatever you see bleeding. Temporarily close scalp lacerations. If you've got an open book fracture of the pelvis, bind it together with a bed sheet. Restore circulatory volume. Crystalloids are by far the most useful. You need to get two liters of saline into the patient as soon as possible. Blood products can come later. All fractures should be immobilized. If the patient responds to volume resuscitation and then goes into shock again, this means there's ongoing blood loss. You need to determine where it is. If they don't respond at all, then you have to consider that they are in, have massive hemorrhage and probably need to go to the operating room immediately if they are to survive. The pregnant patient. The pregnant patient has this mass called the fetus in her abdomen. If she lies unsupported on her back, this will compress the vena cava and the aorta, resulting in hypotension. Put a wedge underneath the patient to allow them to continue to have perfusion through the inferior vena cava and the aorta. Initial assessment, we're now to D. We've done airway, breathing, circulation, now disability. Look at the pupils. What's their size? What's their shape? Do they react to light? A simple way of assessing their level of consciousness. Are they alert? Do they just respond to voice but nothing else? Do they respond to pain but not to voice. And finally, are they completely unresponsive? This AVPU level can really tell you where your patient is at. So, the pupillary exam. If the pupils dilated, it suggests 
transtentorial herniation on one side. It means they have a hematoma. The AVPU scale, alert, responding to verbal stimulus, responding to pain, or unresponsive. Gross neurological exam, do their extremities move? Are they equal and symmetric? The Glasgow Coma Scale, from 3 to 15. If intubation occurs prior to neuroassessment, I would strongly suggest you look at AVPU, which does not depend on an airway. Here's the Glasgow Coma Scale. It depends on eye, verbal, and motor response. Do the eyes open spontaneously to speech, to pain, or unresponsive? Is the patient orient to time, person, and place? Confused? Have inappropriate words? Incomprehensible sounds or no response? Do they obey commands? Move to localized pain? Flexed withdrawal from pain, abnormal reflection, abnormal extension, or no response. Anyone with a Glasgow Coma Scale less than or equal to 8 needs to be intubated. They're not going to be able to ventilate or protect their airway. In disability, we need to decide, is the cervical spine safe to move? We can only make that determination if the patient is alert and orientated to person, place, and time. They have no neurological defects. They are not intoxicated with alcohol or drugs. Their spinous processes are not tender. They've not had a distracting injury and it's painless range of movement of their neck. Otherwise, you must maintain a neck collar and assume that they have a spinal cord lesion. The final step in the initial assessment, exposure. You've done airway, breathing, circulation, check their neurological status. Now you must undress the patient completely. Look at the front, the back, the sides, the perineum, and under the arms too. Why is that? Here is an example. Here's a patient lying on their back. You roll them over. You see two stab wounds entering into the chest. This tells you more about this patient's in injury. So you must expose the entire patient to know what's going on. That is the primary survey, the first part of the initial assessment. Simultaneously with the primary survey, you resuscitate the patient. You oxygenate. You hydrate with fluids. You monitor their vital signs. You monitor their fluid output. A catheter is a good way of doing that, a urinary catheter. You pass an NG tube to decompress their stomach. Single lumen, double lumen, whatever is available. So you've done the primary survey, you're resuscitating the patient. Now you have to do the secondary survey. The survey called the secondary survey is really just a complete physical examination. You assess the patient head to toe. You relook at everything you've already looked at. You assess the three body cavities, the head, the chest, the abdomen and pelvis, and you check the extremities carefully. It's amazing how many things you will miss on your initial assessment. In your secondary survey, you do what they call an ample history. You check for allergies, medications, Often medications will tell you more about the patient's past history than their past history. 
They'll say they don't have a problem, but by the way, they're on an antihypertensive. You do ask about their past history, and if they're unconscious, you ask their family about it. You want to know when they ate last in preparation for the operating room and all events leading up to their injury. So, primary survey, resuscitation, secondary survey. You now know that what's going on with this patient and they now need definitive care. So you transfer them safely for definitive care. You can't ignore them. You have to make sure that everything is maintained stable. And if they destabilize, you go back to the primary survey. Transfer definitive care could be the operating room or the intensive care unit in your own institution. Or if you're not capable of managing the patient, then you safely transfer them to a referral hospital. Triage. What do you do when you have mass casualty? Many patients with trauma. You have to base, place a priority on them. The officer, the most senior person in charge of casualty, has to triage the patients. You can use identification by color for the appropriate reaction time. For example, red, immediate care. Yellow, urgent care, zero to five minutes. Green, delay, you can take care of it in the next few hours. Black, fatal, there is no point. So you don't want to waste time on a fatal injury. So you can tag the patients. Deceased, immediate, delayed, minor. Just some comments about children. They are different. There's a difference in their head to body ratio and their relative size and location of anatomic features. It makes them susceptible to head injuries and abdominal injuries. They have underdeveloped anatomy. The chest is pliable and less protection of the thoracic cage. So there can be damage to internal organs, both in the chest and the abdomen, due to the pliability of their chest wall. Cardiac arrest, when it occurs, is often from respiratory arrest, degraded into cardiac arrest. So always check their respiratory situation, their airway and their breathing. Again, you use A, B, C, D, E. The airway of the child. They have a large head, a large tongue. The epiglottis is floppy and longer. The cricoid is the narrowest part of the child's airway. Lungs have less capacity. Children can only breathe through their nose for the first six months of life. What about vital signs? It varies throughout childhood. The heart rate of a zero to 12 month child is 100 to 160. One to 11 is 70 to 120 and 12 and up becomes more or less like an adult. The respiratory rate varies. 30 to 60 in the child, zero to six months, 20 to four to 30 in the seven to 12 months. The child of one to five years has a respiratory rate of 20 to 30, while six to 11 years is 12 to 20. The teen is similar to an adult. Blood pressure, it's quite low in the six month olds, 65 to 90. In the seven to 12 month old, 80 to 100. The one to 11 year old, 90 to 110. And then we get to the teenager, it gets too similar to an adult. Fluids. Start with 20 milliliters per kilogram bolus of crystalloid. That means you need to know what the weight of your child is. Urine output. 1 to 2 milliliters per kilogram per hour in the infant. 
one to one and a half in the child and down to half for teenagers. So in summary, we've reviewed the initial assessment of the trauma patient. Tomorrow we'll do details on the three body cavities, traumatic brain injury, chest and abdomen. We'll be open to questions.